raw, uncut, and unapologetic. Welcome to Men Talking Mindfulness with your hosts John McCaskill and Will Schneider. Here we focus on helping men and those with men in their lives solve some of life's complex challenges through understanding the practices of mindfulness and how they can help. Each episode is in an environment free of judgment and criticism with a focus on authenticity and inner peace. Let's dig in. Understanding pain is important because it can affect how much things hurt and how much your body can do to tame the beast. This is a quote from pain scientist and our guest on today's show, Dr. Lorimore Mosley. Welcome to the Men Talking Mindfulness Podcast. I'm John McCaskill and each week, my co-host Will Schneider and I, we do our best to break down and demystify an aspect of mindfulness and make it meaningful to you. This week, we're jumping into that subject of pain and Thanks to Dr. Mosley, we'll be looking at it in a way most of us haven't done before. We'll be discussing how meditation and mindfulness can affect your perception of pain, how your understanding of pain affects how much you hurt, how your body learns pain, why this isn't more commonly known information, and when and how pain is good for you, and much more. But first, I'm going to turn it over to Will for some announcements. Will, good to see you, brother. Okay, I almost forgot to turn off my mic. So, <laughs> hey, and, so uh, this particular episode isn't being streamed live because uh, Laws, uh, Dr. Mosley, lives in Australia. But on this day, we just hit over 100,000 downloads on this podcast, and we want to celebrate this milestone and say thank you, our uh, thank you to our audience for helping us to get here and helping us to continue to grow. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, we still have uh, some space open on our Mindfulness Adventure Retreat on May 18th to the 21st in upstate New York. We're going to breathe, move, and get mindful during this four-day, three-night immersive experience that includes four-week integration program as well. If you sign up before March 18th, you'll save $200. So, uh, and to sign up, head to mentalkingmindfulness.com slash retreat to book your spot before they're all gone. Um, hey, and if you're enjoying the show... Please leave us a review. You can, if you're on the Apple uh, podcast app, you can scroll to the bottom, uh, leave us a five star review, and like say something nice about our show. Uh, <laughs> and that helps us to reach more people. Um, and here is the bio uh, for Dr. Lormer uh, Mosley, who we are told to call Laws. Is that correct, Dr. Mosley? Laws? Like, you know, Laws. Sounds pretty okay. good. You're saying that very Australian esque. <laughs> I, I feel like a brother. Australian brother already. Awesome. So Dr. Lorimer, Lorimer Mosley is a pain scientist, educator, and clinician. He has authored over 400 scientific articles and seven books. His contributions to, to our understanding of how pain works, why pain sometimes persists, and what we can do to reduce persistent pain has been recognized uh, by awards or pri prizes in 14 different countries. Wow. And check this out. In 2020, Dr. Mosley was made an officer of the Order of Australia, his country's second highest civil honor for, and this is a quote, distinguished service to humanity at large in the field of pain and its management, science, science communication, medical education, and physiotherapy. He lives and works in Corna County in Adelaide, South uh, Australia. And... Um, we have our little grounding practice, and then we have a lot of questions for you, um, <laughs> Laz, and we appreciate you being here this morning, or this morning, your morning, my evening. John's like, I don't know what he's doing over there. <laughs> so, uh, Nor do I. Uh, Nor do I. Yeah, yeah. I, think I, I think I even butchered, even, even after discussing the, the pronunciation, I think I butchered your first name's uh, pronunciation <laughs> there, Doc. So we're just going to go with Laz. <laughs> so thank you. thank you for making it easy for us. <laughs> so that said, uh, yes, we kick off the show with an opening practice. If this is the first time for you tuning in, that's how we do it. We kick it off that way and we wrap it up that way. So that said, go ahead and get into a comfortable position, whatever that may look like for you. And if closing your eyes is comfortable and safe, then I invite you to do that too. Otherwise, just soften your gaze. Maybe lower your eyelids just slightly. Again, if that is comfortable and safe. And let's just bring our attention to our breath. And we'll just do five intentional and aware breaths together. Begin by emptying your lungs. 
deep breath in, hold at the top, and release, empty, 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 hold empty at the bottom, that's one, deep breath in, pulling your lungs all the way from the bottom to the top, hold at the top, and release, 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 holding empty at the bottom, that's two, deep breath in, in through your nose ideally, hold at the top, and let it go, let it go, let it go, holding empty at the bottom. It's three, two more, deep breath in, filling from the bottom all the way to the top, like a balloon, hold at the top, and release, release, bringing your navel to your spine, squeezing out your lungs, empty, 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 holding empty at the bottom. And last one, deep breath in. And another extra little sip at the top. Hold and release. And as you release, start to bring some movement back into your body, maybe rolling your neck around, your head around, moving your fingers slightly, rolling your shoulders, trying to alleviate some of that pain that we are here to talk about today. So again, thanks Doc Laws for being here with us today. Very excited to get in this conversation and share your knowledge, your experience, your expertise with our audience. And uh, let's, let's kick it off with, let's just talk about basic pain, the basics behind pain. And um, I, I, I was in special operations here in the US. I was in the Navy SEAL teams and we were told, you know, pain is weakness leaving the body. But then we were also told that that pain is a warning sign of, of something being wrong with your body, like uh, an injury. That, and if you feel pain, you need to stop what you're doing and address that injury. What is pain actually? And is it necessarily a sign that something is wrong with our bodies? Wow, the first, the, the first part of that question is really complex. Uh, the second part is very easy. Um, Great. No, it's not necessarily a sign that something's wrong with our bodies. First part, uh, I guess before I get stuck in, it's custom here where I live uh, in Australia to whenever you're in a situation like this to acknowledge uh, whose land I'm sitting on and talking to you guys from, and that's the land of the Ghana people. It's it's written with a K. It's K A U R N A. It's pronounced Ghana like the country in Africa. Okay. And Ghana nation has been uh, living on this land for probably 40,000 years, which wow. is a very, very long time. It's the, it's the oldest enduring culture. The, the Australian First Nations people are the oldest enduring culture of our species, actually. Wow. Uh, and I pay my respects to First Nations people everywhere, wherever you are. If you listen to this, I pay my respects. Uh, Ghana land was never ceded, uh, never will be. Uh, I definitely dip my lid to elders past, present and emerging and their connection to land, sea and water. Um, it. With equal respect, I sort of wade tentatively into this question that you asked, John, because it's, it's for me, mind-blowingly complex. What is pain? And there's two ways I could approach that question. The, the easy way is, well, you tell me. You know, you've had it. We've all had it. What is it? What does it feel like? You know, what's the point? That sort of stuff. And... And I guess that's a really important aspect of the question that people like me in a clinical or scientific role have to hang on to all the time because the expert of anyone's pain is the person who's experiencing it. Uh, and it's, it's a really different uh, question when, when you ask, okay, from your perspective as a neuroscientist, which is what I am, uh, and, and a pain scientist, Tell me about pain. That's that's. I feel really comfortable with that. But if a, a person in front of me, like uh, yesterday, I was seeing a a person who had thirty five years of pretty unrelenting uh, back and neck pain. Uh, it's a very different scenario for for me to be so presumptuous as to say, oh, "I'll tell you about your pain," mm. yeah, because 
they're the boss, right? They're the expert on it. So if I take the question as uh, an open invitation to say, well, how, how do we try and make sense of it in the scientific field, in the clinical field? Uh, I would say that the, the best overgeneralized, oversimplistic answer to that question is that pain is a feeling that, that you get in your body uh, that's unpleasant, and it makes you want to do something to protect that part of your body. And if you have that pain all over your body, then it makes you want to do something to protect the structure of your entire body. It's quite unusual to have pain all over your body. We normally have it located somewhere. Um, and about one in 10 humans has persisting low back pain. That's the most common area to have, to have pain. Yeah. Yep. Uh, about one in five humans has persisting pain, uh, good chunk of those back pain, as I said. And what you want to do when you have back pain is to protect your back. So uh, that might be through seeking care or it might be through moving differently or, or choosing different behaviours. Uh, you, know, you, might, you might choose to not go for a walk or not sit in a chair for too long because you've got pain. So pain is this... Is it, and I think this... This might sound really straightforward, but it's actually a real. Uh, uh, Will you gave me full permission to use the full most permission? Word, but, um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not by nature a swearer. I, I don't, I don't tend to swear in any context, except when I'm talking about pain. Sometimes, you know, like, and I think that's that's because it's the, it's the language of suffering. Sometimes, you know. Mm. Right? So, um, if if you'll excuse what I'm about to say, you know that. This idea of pain being a feeling that's generated by you and, and the last organ to touch it. Remember those games? You know, you're the last one to touch it. Yep, yep. Uh, the last organ to touch it is, is the brain. So I tend to say, well, it's produced by the, by the brain. Pain is a, is a protective feeling. And to get your head around that in a really deep, deep in your belly kind of way, is a, it really is a mind fuck. Because it really has, it, it, it means you have to let go of some of the things that feel so intuitively sensible, you know, like it, it, the fact that it feels so much like there's something wrong in this part of your body is why it's so effective at getting you to protect this part of your body. But John, you're, you, you talked about um, the, those conflicting messages about pain that you received in the special forces. Pain is weakness leaving the body. Right. And pain is a sign that something's wrong. But you can't you can't coexist with those two understandings of the same thing. Right, <laughs> right. right. But, but that, that in itself is okay, so what do I do? And and in most pain scenarios in our lives, nearly every single pain scenario in our life does not involve tissue damage in any way. Right? In fact, it stops tissue damage. Right? So we'll be sitting here by the end of our chat. You know, we'll be moving around in the chair because something just niggled a little bit, something hurt a bit, you know, but you, you're not damaging anything there. It's the pain that makes you do something to protect your, your tissues from damage. And and that it works really well most of the time, but sometimes it doesn't work. And the times that it doesn't work are when when a threat to the tissues, and normally that's a what we would say is a mechanical threat, so it's a force on the tissues some sort of mechanical force in the tissues. It happens too quickly for the inbuilt protective system. So we have these sensors all over our body that they don't, they don't know what pain is. They just know that this is an unusual force, right? That, or this is an unusual chemical balance, or this is an unusual temperature. And they send signals into the brain via the spinal cord just saying that, saying something's different here. And then the brain, the big kahuna, has to work out is this, is this something that we need to protect you from? And if it is, the brain fires into your consciousness a feeling that makes you stop what you're doing and change your behaviour, and that feeling is pain. If, if that force or temperature, you know, so say a burn, yeah, if, the, if the change in temperature or the force happens too quickly, that system can't alert you to the problem in time to save you from damage. Right, so a burn is a great example of that. We just sometimes we just do not have 
the speed of response in our system. The other time that it fails, so we end up getting an injury, uh, or, or we might talk more broadly and say pathology, you know, something going wrong, is when the change happens too slowly. Right? So mm. the system's there to detect change. And if the change happens really slowly, so let's say you've got a really slow-growing tumour, really slow-growing cancer, it, the growth doesn't get picked up by our right. sensors because it's too slow a change. And we do experiments in the lab where we, we put on a slightly hot thermode, on the, say, on the back of your hand, uh, and it never really hurts that much, but if we left it on for long enough, you would have second-degree burns without having experienced a lot of pain on the way because the change wow. in temperature would be too slow. Whereas if wow. we put on a 60-degree thermode, you can respond to that pretty quickly and you can actually withdraw your, your hand from it. So the pain system fails to protect us really only under two conditions. It happens too quickly or it happens too slowly. And I guess the third is if there's something more important going on. And, John, you'd have insight into that from your work in special forces. If, if your entire existence is under threat at a moment right. in time, the brain won't choose to produce a feeling to protect your foot from the blister. Right. Yeah, there's, mm. there's, there's mechanical forces on your foot and, and the system tells your brain that. It says, this is unusual, unusual forces. But your brain is also getting data that suggests your life is under threat here. And if you, you guys just imagine, if you were the executive controller sitting inside someone's <laughs> brain and you thought, okay, do I protect the foot or do I stay alive? Listen. Hopefully they're going to choose staying alive. No brainer, right? <laughs> It'll choose staying alive. In fact, uh, you guys might not be old enough for that, but do you remember staying oh, yeah. alive? Oh, yeah, the song. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, totally. That should be a catch cry. Choose staying alive. Um, so, you know, so, so the brain is always prioritising stuff and it does that in the moment, even if, if you have had pain for years. Everyone who has pain for years will have moments in their life where they are entirely pain-free, entirely pain-free. It's just that during that moment they might be petrified or feeling nauseous or in feeling in love or something else. You know, the brain's producing these feelings with an, with an agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. And so to go right back to your question, what, what is pain? <laughs> I, I reckon pain is a protective feeling and it is produced when all the available information, right, the, the data coming from your body, the data stored inside your head, I mean, everything we've ever done is, is stored really. Even though, you know, things that you know that you don't know that you know, all that stuff affects whether or not your brain will decide to protect your body at a moment in time. And if it decides, yeah, okay, it's time to protect, you'll have pain. And if it's a, your whole body under threat, you'll have fear, for example. Mm. Or you might mm. have fatigue. Right? And then we get into situations that are, that are not uncommon at all where people have all of those things. They have fear anxiety, they have fatigue, they have low mood, you know, they feel like, oh, I don't want to see anyone. And these are all, and they have pain, they have stiffness. These are all feelings that are produced by your brain in very sophisticated and, in my view, mind-blowingly glorious ways, right? It's true, the, the fearful and wonderful complexity of, of the human is, it strikes me every day, that it can produce all these feelings that have an agenda, for you, the organism, to keep you safe. The bummer is when they're being produced when you're not actually in danger. Right. And, and an accessible <laughs> version or, or uh, equivalent of that is post-traumatic stress, when you, when you feel very frightened when there is actually no risk. The mm -hmm. feeling's entirely real, right? No one doubts the feeling. Uh, it's, Bit of a challenge in my field is that uh, because we've thought for so long that pain is something that happens in your body and is sent to your brain if you've got an injury then someone who has pain but no evidence of injury feels illegitimized invalidated right and try telling them their pain's not real try that mm. and their pain is 100 real because pain is 100 percent every single time you have pain it's a feeling generated by the brain in, in response to all the available data. You know, it's not a personality problem. It's not a, you know, make it up. 
Yeah. Anyway, you can tell that when I get asked questions about pain, I, I've got a lot to say, right? I love you it. Do. That's why we brought you on the show is not to hear ourselves <laughs> speak. We, we want you to talk. <laughs> so well, why don't we, why don't we uh, you know, get a little nerdy and geeky and actually talk a little bit more about the brain. And, you know, I watched a lecture that you did, I believe, is at the University of Washington. Uh, I think it was like 2017. And, and I was very fascinated about uh, I mean, what you just said about how pain is really just a, a very subjective experience in a lot of ways. And it really is not just the mind. Um, and the body wanting to protect itself, but it also has, uh, it's influenced by, you know, the past experiences, it's influenced by the environment you're actually in in that particular moment. And uh, I was really fascinated by, um, you know, when you talked about neurotags and how, um, you know, they, you know, uh, compete as well as collaborate in order to, you know, create a pain response or to shut down a particular response. So. Maybe we can dive a little bit deeper into the brain. I'd love to, you know, pick your brain <laughs> about yeah. uh, what's what's going on there. Yeah, well, good homework work, Will. Well done, mate, that, that you've, you've managed to find discussion of neurotag. So for those many people who haven't heard that term before, neurotag is, is just uh, another way of talking about a neural network. So a network of neurons and immune cells within your brain or within your spinal cord. So we now understand that the, the um, if, if people have ever seen a drawing of what a spinal cord looks like on the inside, they would have seen a grey butterfly inside a white circle. Uh, and they and talk about the grey matter and the white matter of the spinal cord. And the, the white matter is uh, neurons like freeways taking information up and down. And the grey matter is really... It's really just brain matter, right? That's that's gone down the spinal cord. I mean, it's, it's all meant to be there, obviously, but it's it, we think about neural networks, so neuroimmune networks that I'll now call neurotags, exist all throughout that grey matter, from the spinal cord all the way up and and all over your your brain. And one way of thinking about the brain, and I think this is probably the favourite way among neuroscientists now at the moment. I mean, it's, it's extraordinarily complex, right? <laughs> there, are, there are billions of cells inside your brain. Um, about half of them are nerve cells and about half of them are immune cells. It was, it was only sort of 15 years ago that we even discovered that the immune cells do stuff. Uh, and they do a lot of stuff. So we talk about these neurotags, and you mentioned the idea of neurotags uh, collaborating and competing for influence. And that's something when we're teaching, uh, you know, physically, physical therapists and doctors and scientists about neurotags. We talk about the principles that govern how they work. All right. So you did say, well, we were going to go nerdy. <laughs> you okay yes, with this? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with this. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, go for it. Let's dive in. We, so have, there, a, we have a very sophisticated audience. So let's Well, let's, well played. Well played, Will. Them. Sophisticated. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, between the two of you, I mean, Will with the beard and the glasses, right? And you, John, with that your, your beautiful white toothed, beautiful look. <laughs> you look, you look like you're the real legitimate podcast. Like it's, it's we look, we look like we're the legitimate. <laughs> we, are. we are, we are, guys, we are. Like, you know, like I, I've heard, I did a bit of research. You know, I've heard. Okay. Yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> Any, anyway, let's go back to the nerd. Because I love this stuff, and it really does, in my in my opinion, give great validation to people who are challenged by persisting pain, persisting uh, feelings of stress and uh, post traumatic stuff, persisting fatigue, uh, persisting hunger, uh, and if we can understand how neurotags work according to the common favourite model of how the brain works at the moment, it does offer some. Uh, explanation but also hope for the future I think so yes. neurotags uh, we can conceptualize anything that the brain does as being the result of neurotags being activated so the so all the words that I'm saying now it, we could say well that's because I'm activating the neurotags to make these words Right, so you guys just both nodded, and I could say, "Well, we know you activated the neurotags that make you nod." Right, right. 
And all of the neurotags that do things outside of the brain, like behaviours or thoughts uh, or feelings like pain or I need to go to the toilet or anything like that, or send a motor command, so a a command to your muscles to make you move or to make you brace, uh, not move, all that sort of stuff. We can talk about that as one kind of neurotag. Uh, and and then we, we have to remember that underneath that neurotag, that neurotag is only being activated because of the sum total of all the other neurotags that are influencing it. Right? So a single neurotag that makes you guys nod is being influenced by uh, content of what I'm saying, my own nod, right? I, could, I just did it then, right? I can make you nod just by nodding. Right. Mirror neurons. So, yeah, mirror neurons. Uh, mirror neurons are parts of neurotags that influence other ones. So we can just go right down in this hierarchy. We've got these neurotags that span across the entire brain and they're really big. They've got a lot of cells in them, right? They're really powerful and influential neurotags. Then if we could go right, we could go right down to the area in the brain the size of a, of a pinhead and we would have little neurotags in there. And those little neurotags are influencing other ones that are a bit bigger and a bit bigger and a bit bigger and a bit bigger. And we're until we get into the real action output neurotags. And when we start to think about the brain like that, all of the stuff that we've learned in pain science and pain management in the last 50 or 100 years starts to make sense, right? If we don't think about pain as the output of neurotags, then all the stuff we've learned about pain doesn't make sense. It really, it really doesn't make sense. Uh, and for example, you know, we, we can look at the sort of experiments that we do in our lab. And, the, and one of the experiments that captures this, I think, really nicely and simply, and I probably mentioned it in the, was it, did you say U of Washington talk that you looked at? Yeah, U of Washington talk, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was great. Um, that might, I think that might have been the uh, Bill Fordyce talk and uh, Bill Fordyce was it was from Seattle and changed healthcare around pain in the in the sort of mm. uh, 60s 70s and his family came to that talk and it was all very emotional it was lovely very influential guy um, anyway that, that I imagine I talked about it there in the Bill Fordyce talk that that we do this experiment where we put a very cold stimulus on the back of the hand of supposedly normal, healthy volunteers, right? They, yep. They're not entirely normal because they're volunteering for a pain experiment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's say aside from that, you know, if, I guess if, if we're being honest, they are abnormal because they're volunteering for a pain experiment. They're probably poor because they'll get, re, uh, get some money for participation. <laughs> they might be doing pretty badly in their studies and this might give them a chance to, you know, get a good relationship with the professor. Let's pretend they're normal people, all right, aside from that. If we put this really cold stimulus on the back of their hand and we show them a, just a visual cue, right, and we choose to show them either a red visual cue or a light blue visual cue, and just by that visual cue, their experience related to the, the stimulus on their hand can be very, very different. And without telling you what the difference is, I could just ask you, if you put a, a, a potentially dangerous stimulus on the back of someone's hand and you show them a red light at the same time, it occurs together, or you show them a blue light, which scenario is going to give you more pain? Red light. Red light. It's intuitive, isn't it? And it makes a lot of sense, right? Red means hot. It means danger. Yeah. Right, blue doesn't mean hot, and it often means you know cool and uh, you know not you know maybe safe or certainly not danger. And in those in those experiments that that we do in very controlled situations, so we control for everything we can possibly control for, right? We see that for some people, they get exa- it's exactly the same stimulus on their hand every time. There's no change in the stimulus on their hand. But if they see the red light, some people will have an eight out of ten pain with the red right. light and a two out of 10 pain with the blue light right. consistently. Other people, it's it's very close. And there were two people in this one experiment I'm thinking of, of about 40 participants. There were two people for whom there was no effect of the light. And wow. in neuroscience terms, we just call those people idiots. 
<laughs> because their brain's not it, the the light, the visual cues not influential for them at all. Uh, you know, people have said so. Were they colorblind? They weren't colorblind, but uh, they sort of were in their brain. The, the cue didn't mean anything, right? And it takes us back to that idea of you know the pain is not giving you a measure of of what's happening at your hand. It's really giving you a measure of how convinced your brain is that you have to get out of this situation. Right. And even is, even when there's no, even point. when there's no stimulus, which is which is sorry, I don't mean to get, which is fascinating, right? There's like no stimulus. You're just looking at a color, and you're like, but you're also in this experiment though. You're, um, are you um, kind of leading your, you know, your te- your test subjects into like a potential narrative, like one is bad one is good or, or right they're question. just figuring out that on their own yeah outstanding question so just to clarify one bit they they always received a stimulus on their hand okay right so the only thing that changed was the color of the visual cue that coincided oh got it stimulus. okay okay so it'd always yeah. be some sort of yeah. yeah stimulus but okay got it yeah um but in answer to your question no so in our experiment no nothing Right, it was very controlled. We didn't mention the visual cues; they were just there, and we did a few other conditions. So there was one where the visual cue occurred slightly before. That was another experiment, slightly before the stimulus on the hand, um, and that showed the same same sort of responses. Um, we were very interested in what happens if it occurs at exactly the same time. So we don't have enough time to develop an expectation of what's about to occur. Yeah, yeah, uh, and in, and in actual fact, that that can mess with the the feelings in counterintuitive ways, you know, right? Because you, you you get the red cue saying this is going to be hot, right? So if you if we created that expectancy, this is going to be hot, and then we gave them a very cold stimulus, then we the individual can actually overcorrect, right? Because they they're expecting forty two degrees, and well, you guys. What's that? 100 something. Year old fashioned <laughs> archaic Hot. get with the Fuck program Hot. way of measuring temperature. <laughs> I don't know. I don't All know right, why we still use it. <laughs> no one knows why you still use it. All right. Um, anyway, so so if they were, if if their system was expecting a signal that would be consistent with 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and they get a signal that's actually uh, I have to make this up 70 degrees Fahrenheit, then we have. We know that the brain is always looking for errors in its predictions. Uh, and that big error could be enough for the brain to think, whoa, I'm way off, and it creates a feeling of even colder than it really oh, is. Oh, wow. Yeah. So expectations and predictions are, are really powerful neurotags that influence ultimate neurotags in advance. So talking about getting nerdy, it, the neurotags in that, ex, in that situation would that would be involved in finally determining how much your hand hurts when you have a cold stimulus paired with a red light. We have neurotags that represent red, right? So right. neurotags of the color red. We have neurotags that link the color red to danger. Yeah. We have neurotags of something's happening on your hand. Neurotags of you're in an experiment. Neurotags of the <coughs> experiment student, PhD student, it's a bit smelly today. We have neurotags <laughs> of, of whatever caffeine's in your system uh, or what you ate last night. We have neurotags that are representing how well you slept. Neurotags that are that are involved in your genetics. Like, like people with people who are redheads, natural redheads, on average have a slightly more active um, sensory detection system for temperature change. Uh, just on average. So you have these neurotags of what culture you live in, uh, what are your past experiences in life, what's your general health at the moment. All of these things affect the pain you experience with a highly controlled experimental stimulus put on your hand. So much so that exactly, so we do other experiments, say with laser, we shoot a laser gun onto someone's hand or leg or something, and we deliver exactly the same stimulus 50 times let's say, with, with no other, no colours or cues, and there's no one else even in the room, the little laser machine's just sort of moving a little bit, zap, moving a little bit, zap, just does that, and they report how much each zap hurts. And the, mod, the, the variability in that zap will be around about three or four points on a 10-point scale. 
And what that reflects is all the neuro tags that are humming away inside our brains at any one moment. You know, they might, they might just have a neuro tag that's managed to win the competition that remembers, shit, I left the bath running at home, right? Right? And that, in that moment, we zap them, they don't even feel it. Wow. They don't have it. They don't have pain because there's something else that's going on in the neuro tags underneath. And then alternatively, you know, we, we then, this other thing happens and, and you realise that you, you know, you, you're back on the turps. Do you have that phrase? Your, your commitment to reduce your alcohol intake, you're letting yourself oh, down yeah. a bit. And in that moment, we zap you and it hurts more because you're they're just this extra little neuro tag for danger. So we don't talk about neuro tags very often with patients, right? Because it's nerdy. Sophisticated. So what we do talk about is is what we call dims and sims. Yeah, and I enjoyed Australia, reading that. Yeah, yeah. you guys call them dumb sums, right? Or dim sums or something. It like dim sounds like we're going to go to a, what, a Asian to, restaurant. To go, go get some food. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, well, that leads you into the, you know, uh, yeah, so please get let's get into sims and dims and, and your protect the meter, right? Or your protometer, uh, which, which is great. And, and, you know, I have here written down... Uh, something you said like pain equals evidence of danger uh in me which are dims minus the evidence of safety in me which are the sims so yeah. this maybe can kind of uh get us deeper into the mind and and i, I love this uh i was digging into this uh protectometer i guess is probably the proper way to say it but yeah please i love this uh well i think uh you guys in north america i think you'd be inclined to say protectometer is that right yeah, Probably, I, so. and I yeah. would be inclined to say. I remember at the start before we started, I just said, if you if you want an Australian accent, you just have to imagine that your IQ is dropped by thirty five points, uh, and <laughs> then you say the same it. words, and they just come out a bit differently. So this would be <laughs> protector meter. Protector meter. Uh, okay, yeah. But you say however you want. Like that's the beauty of the word, right? It's, it's such a <laughs> brand new word. There's no rules on how you say it. So. Uh, the the idea of the protector meter and dims and sims is really it's just a metaphor, right? It's just a it's just a a way of understanding what we currently think happens when you have pain, right, inside your brain. So we've been talking about neuro tags, but we could easily just talk about dims, so evidence of danger in me. So back to that hand of the light example. You know, the fact that it's a red light is evidence of danger. So that's a dim. Right? The fact that you're the experimental uh, researcher has bad BO today and you don't quite trust them, that's a dim. The fact that you've just realised, man, I haven't slept well for six weeks, that's a dim. Mm. The fact that you haven't slept well for six weeks is a dim. And so we've done experiments where we... We, um, we deceive people about how much they slept last night. Uh, and we, they come into the lab, or this quite a long time ago, come into the lab and you, have a, you basically have a fake sleep quality readout. Uh, and you say to them, we randomly allocate them to say, uh, well, the data show, you the, show us that you didn't sleep very well last night. Right? Or the data shows us you had a great night's sleep last night. Uh, and then we also have data about how good their sleep actually was, right? So we now know that thinking you had a bad night's sleep is a dim. Wow. So is having a bad night's sleep. But you could have a good night's sleep but think you had a bad night well, and that's still a dim, all right? So both of the things are important, how, how well you sleep and how well you think you sleep. And we could go through all these all these real tangible things that tell your system there is some danger in me. You know, you've just had a vaccine, right? Your immune system's responding to that. Or you've just had a virus, right? That's evidence of danger. So we know that if, you've, if you're in the middle of fighting off a virus and we give you an experimental stimulus, it's going to hurt more, all other things being equal, right? Because your immune system is fired up and we know that your immune system is really important particularly in chronic pain, right? So we've got all these dims. And then on the other side of the ledger, we've got all these sims, right, which is evidence of safety in me. So we've got a particular, particularly attractive researcher doing the, the experiment. 
that's an evidence of safety. Or that researcher might remind you in some way without you realising of your mum who you love very much and loves you very much. Alternatively, that researcher might remind you in some way and you don't know this, you just pick up cues, their voice, the shape of their head, the way they walk might be the same as someone who's actually highly threatening to you. One thing I love, John, in your introductory mindfulness thing today was uh, to remind us all, close your, your eyes if it is safe to do so. That's beautiful, right? Because we know for some people the act of closing their eyes might be a dim. Right. All right so we can go through all that sort of stuff. And the, the, the protector meter and the dim sim idea, in fact, the consumers that we work with, so patient partners, a lot of our research involves a lot of what we call con consumer advisors or consumer partners. I think in the US you, you tend to call them patient partners. But what we hear from them is they start talking about this as their dim sim therapy. And they, they end up thinking, okay, well, I'm going to have to go into the office today to meet with the boss, for example. And that's a highly dangerous situation. What sims can I pack with me? You know, what, what are the sims? So I'll make sure I've eaten well, slept well. Uh, I might take my favourite trustworthy person in with me. These are all, these are all things that have real-life biological effects. You know, they're not, they're not flaky. Right. They're real-life biological effects. And the progression of the dim sim and protector meter idea just recently. So we, I've just spent a week on an island off, off Adelaide called Kangaroo Island, a spectacular part of the world. In fact, I reckon New York Times might have ranked it in, uh, uh, I think, in the top 10 places to go. Anyway, you should go to Kangaroo Island. Awesome. I spent a week there rewriting this book on the protector meter and we've, we've updated it to, to think about an amplifier in the brain. Uh, and if you get a piece of information from your body to say something's different, all right, so... We're letting go of this idea that you never get information from your body saying something's damaged or something's in pain. You just get data to say something's different. And then that goes through an amplifier and the amplifier has five different sliders on it. And we get people to think through those sliders. So one slider is your previous experiences in life. One slider is your general health. One slider is your current environment. One slider is your beliefs about what this is, about who you are, about what context it is, all that. And one slider is your behaviours around that. And we get people to slowly work through all of those things and identify all the dims, so all the things that take the sliders up, because that's going to make pain and inflammation and immune activity worse. And all, this, all the sims that take any of those sliders down, because it's going to make pain and inflammation better. Uh, and that sounds like a really simple, you know, dim sim model, but it actually integrates highly complex neuroscience and immune science from across many fields into a coherent way of thinking, okay, well, I can, there's a lot of ways I can influence my pain, actually. Uh, and and there's, that means there's a lot of things that I could learn to get better at, to retrain neural pathways in order to reverse this. And I'm talking now about people with chronic persisting pain. In order to reverse this this pattern of hypersensitivity that we know characterises people, uh, almost without exception, characterises people with chronic pain. With, with the DIMS and SIMS in mind, uh, meditation and mindfulness, does that, I'm assuming, I mean, just based on the conversation that we've had, had thus far, if you meditated in a certain way, or if you live mindfully, it would affect your pain. Is, there, is that an accurate statement? And, and are there studies that prove this? Yeah, I, I believe it's an accurate statement. I think it's um, uh, about the second half. Uh, no, I think there would be studies, yeah. There, um, it's whenever we look for evidence whether an intervention works. Right? So our research group does research from what we would call the discovery end. We, we only ever deal with real life entire humans, so we don't do experiments with animals or you know, taking parts of animals and all that. We do experiments with human volunteers. Uh, and then we do everything from there right up to these clinical trials or, 
or population level interventions. Right, so if we're going to answer the second part of your question, does an intervention work at the moment? Uh, as far as evidence is concerned, we need to do a randomised control trial of that intervention. And we need to pick a control treatment that matches the intervention for everything except the thing we think is important. All right, so that, randomised control trials are, are very expensive and very difficult to do well. Uh, we've got about five running at the moment. They cost about one and a half million dollars each to do a wow. randomised control wow. trial. So, you know, it's not a trivial thing. So to answer your second question, there, there are definitely studies, there's a lot of studies that involve experiments where they've taken high, highly skilled meditators or mindfulness experts uh, and they deliver certain stimuli to them and they ask them to put themselves into a meditative state or perhaps into a mindful state, which is more about somatic. So targeting attention across the body somewhere. And they show that the same stimulus hurts less when they're in that state than if they're not. And it hurts less for them than it does for someone who's a novice or an untrained meditator. So there's very good experiments like, like that. There are, there's a group in California who's done a lot of work with you know, professional meditators, if that makes sense. Like people who have been, that's their thing, you know, monks and... <clears throat> Uh, nuns uh, in Buddhist tradition or something like that and they go into the brain scanner and go into a meditative state and you see these very different activations of the brain in response to the same stimulus. So there's very compelling evidence that getting better at meditation and, and at mindfulness allows you to have a greater influence over what your brain does yeah. When it's, for example, under threat, for example, with a with a stimulus. But most of the time, we know we're we're playing football and we're about to rupture our cruciate ligament. We're not going to think, "I'll oh, just go into a moment of mindfulness." Right? <laughs> yeah, right. 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 But when we start talking about people who are challenged by persisting pain or persisting uh, post trauma, then there is there is very compelling reasons to become highly skilled at. Uh, meditation and mindfulness, one, for its, its clear effect on what your brain does with data. Mm -hmm. uh, but another one is that we, one of those sliders I talked about was general health. Uh, we know that daily practice of mindfulness on average is better for your general health. But we also know that when you go into a mindful state, even in that short exercise that you did at the beginning, you immediately change the activation of other systems in our body, so that the sympathetic nervous system or the autonomic mm. system. So, you, so would you be saying in, in those states you're kind of creating sims, like more safety for safety in me? Is that yeah, yeah. absolutely. You are you are creating sims of a wide variety. You know, you're creating sims in the moment of I'm I'm calm. I've got a lovely voice here talking me through my breathing. <laughs> I'm safe. You know, these, these are very powerful cognitive cues, in mm. my view. The tone of voice, uh, Mark Jensen, who's an outstanding um, uh, pain researcher, clinician, and does uh, a lot of hypnotic suggestion as part of his interventions. He's at uh, U of Washington. Uh, you know, he, he does a lot of work on this, looking e even at the tone of voice and the intonation that you use when you're walking mm. someone through one of these sessions changes your pattern of brain activity. Mm. And when you change your pattern of brain activity, your whole body is involved in some way and this incredible system of sensors out there in your body detect, ah, we're in a safe place. Right, so not only do you have the immediate cognitive cues, auditory cues, uh, metacognitive cues, you actually have real-life biological signals coming from your body that say, you're safe, you're safe, you're safe. Yeah. All of those signals are very, very small, but remember the complexity of the neurotag story. You get enough of them and you start to see genuine shifts in the ultimate influence because neurotags will are competing and collaborating for influence. You change your blood pressure in, what, 20 seconds when you do an exercise like that. Uh, I meditate every time I go to the sock. Yeah, all of the sensors in your body, 
They detect yeah. the change in blood pressure. Yeah. They detect your yeah. change in heart rate. They detect that, hang on, we've got a little bit less adrenaline, or I think you guys might say epinephrine. Uh, it notices less cortisol. It notices. In fact, in yeah. fact, it can be anti-inflammatory. And, and we have detectors out there to say, hey, we've got, we've just had a reduction in the, what we call pro-inflammatory cytokines flying around in our blood. Wow. Right. So, so we are, and I say this so many times when I'm in this context, we are so fearfully and wonderfully complex that mm. to, uh, to attach the meaning of a persistent pain to a dysfunctional pathology in a single part of your body is to me denying some of the most beautiful scientific developments humanity has made over the last hundred years. You know, we are a unified organism. You can't do anything without somewhere else in your body detecting you've done it. Yeah, and, I, and I love it and it's full of possibility, but it, it has a dark side as well. I don't know if you, you think about getting onto that, but the, the, um, the adaptability, the incredible cleverness and capacity to learn that we have has a dark yeah. side, right? Mm. Because it makes us more sensitive to some things. If we if we keep producing pain, the system gets better at producing pain. Mm. Yeah, so you end up having pain when you're not in any danger anymore. And you you said I think one of you mentioned the idea of uh, how we how our body learns. I think it was you, John, said you know our body learns pain, and mm. this is a um, at once very intimidating reality and exciting opportunity for scientists, healthcare professionals, and people challenged by pain and their friends and partners and family uh, because it says, yep, yeah, if you've had pain for three years or six months, the protective buffer that is being offered by your pain, right, so pain is all about protecting us, is getting bigger. And it's it, it can get so big that it stops you doing the very things you, your body needs you to do to fully recover. And this is a really challenging situation because the, the, the problem now is not in the body part that hurts. It might not be perfect, no worries, but the problem is in the system. We say in the pain system. And there's, there's a handful of, of very vocal uh, people out there, retired health professionals or, or young researchers, there's a handful of them who hate this idea. Uh, they hate the idea of the system being able to learn, or even the idea that there is a system. Uh, yeah. But, but I, the reason I, I think it's really important to, to use these sort of terms, you know, we don't have a pain system like we have a nervous system or a musculoskeletal system, or, you know, but we have a, a system that is there looking after our body that consists of neurons, immune cells, endocrine, gut, muscles, bone, thoughts, all this stuff. But together, I think we, we can call a system, but more important, our patient partners, consumer advisors say, well, whatever you call it, we're calling it a system because we can make sense of it if we think about it. It's the pain system that's become hypersensitive. And it's the mm. pain system that we now need to train back to normal levels of hypersensitivity. And, and we could say exactly, back to normal levels of sensitivity, we could say exactly the same thing about post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. The protection of your whole body system, you know, let's say maybe the fear system, is hypersensitive because it's adapted over time and or it's had a single event that makes it, absolutely important to protect you from a whole range of situations but when those situations include the very things you need to do to have the life you want then we've got a problem with fear system hypersensitivity right does that does that way of thinking make sense 100 percent yeah so if we're in that does. situation you know, treating persisting pain or persisting fear uh as though it's a problem in a particular part of your body seems to me like yeah. a moronic thing to do. You know, we, we have to train, we say we train the brain and the body and we have to retrain it over time. No one can do anything to you to remove this hypersensitivity. Well, You've got to retrain uh, your system and that's the real challenge. I, I, was, uh, I was shocked at you said the first 
line of defense uh, for back pain, or, and that's, I guess this can almost go for any pain, is education and advice re to remain active. And I was like, wow. And then, uh, but then I guess that can lead us into like, so why are people so attached to their pain? Is it because the story they keep telling themselves and the relationship because of that story that they continually to live in their environment and therefore they're just continually looking for, you know, saying something like, um, you know, oh, my back is always bad or I always have back pain. And therefore our, our brain, you know, uh, you said here that uh, um, I think it's any and all data is stored to help make a decision. And you, your brain uses all incoming data. So if you put yourself into this mental state of like, I'm all, my, my back is in chronic pain, I guess we keep going out and look for evidence for that pain. And, uh, and I just thought, I don't know where you want to go with that. but uh, You know, it's, it, I, I want to start any discussion like this with a really emphatic reminder that having persisting pain is brutal and it is really hard to recover. It's really, I want to make that really clear and that uh, there are contributors to your likelihood of developing chronic pain that are way beyond your control. You know, there's some genetic involvement, there's a, you know, there's a whole lot of factors about you know, how you grew up, how you know where you lived, what you've eaten all your life, your social determinants of health are really important, um, all that sort of stuff. There are, among, among all of those things, there are things that we can change. There are things that we can't. And the things that we can change involve that amplifier. You, know, you, you can change your general health. You can change, you can't change your past experiences, but you can change your understanding of how they might be linked to the situation. Uh, and you started off by saying, uh, almost talking about, you know, why, why do people um, keep, you know, keep, you didn't say this, but keep searching for the single cure or something like that. It's a really common um, yeah. observation. Um, you could easily ask, why is this such a big problem <laughs> in humanity? You know, chronic pain by any metric is the most disabling health problem we have. It's the most expensive health problem we have. Right? And it affects, as I said before, you know, one in five people, one in ten people really badly. Right? So it's also a huge a moneymaker. Yeah. Well, there's half the or not half, there's a part yeah. of the answer. Right? So we have developed in the healthcare professions entire professions that entire professions that deliver care for people with chronic pain as though we still understand pain like we did in the 1950s. Right? They deliver care for chronic pain as though it is an acute injury that hasn't healed yet. Mm. Now, there is an occasional person who has an acute injury that hasn't healed yet, right? and they do well to fix that injury. They're very unusual situations, but they exist. But even that person will have a pain system that has learned to be more efficient over time. So it will feel worse than it is. Uh, and and we've got to be really really sure when we talk about this that it the pain is what you feel. All you know about this is your pain, and we we can't slip into even phrases that we don't even think about. Like as a as a health professional, we you know we spend time trying to teach health professionals not to say things very well meaning like, look, I know for you your pain is real, right? Because what that actually implies is it's not for me. Uh -huh. You know, uh, we have to be really careful about it. Or, or your pain feels, your, your pain, you, you feel like you have more pain than you have. That's an erroneous statement. You can't feel like you have more pain than you have because what you feel is the pain that you have. Right. Right? But as health professionals, we need to be really careful not to yeah. say those things because people in pain have spent the entire time being in pain dealing with people who don't believe them because those people have an old-fashioned understanding of pain. That is, if you don't have an injury, you can't have pain. Right. So why why does it why do we persist in searching for a single cure or trying to allocate pain to a single source of the body? Part of it is because that's that's how we used to think pain worked. Why is it so hard to change what we think about that? Well, because it feels like that. It feels like there's a problem. 
in exactly one place. And that's where the pain is. And that's why pain is so effective. You know, we've evolved to have such a compelling feeling. It would be useless if pain was, you know, you sort of felt pain in your relationships or, 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 or in the fridge or something. That would be stupid. We feel it in a given anatomical part, you know, part of the body. It's compelling. So one reason is that it feels like that. Another reason is that healthcare professionals have been very slow to, to change their own understanding of the problem. And I think, John, you have touched on one significant contributor to that is they feel like it will undermine their, their income, their identity and their livelihood. So the structural changes that need to occur inside our healthcare systems around pain are significant. That's an understatement. Yeah. And they're actually more significant in most parts of the US than they are in most parts of Australia, if you like, right? Because uh, we have universal private health insurance and, and healthcare professionals don't get paid according to how many treatments they deliver. Okay. Whereas in a lot of contexts where you guys are, it's a, it's a really strict fee-for-service model. So it's, it's in everyone's interests for the problem to not get fixed in a way. Right. And I know in some jurisdictions, I think in California, in the, in the workers' compensation scheme, uh, it, it extends into the legal frameworks of care so that there's actually an advantage to being more disabled uh, for the lawyers and perceived advantage for the clients. I, I don't think that's a real advantage because they're more disabled. Um, so why doesn't it move? Well, I think it does come down to education and, and that's why, I mean, five years ago, six years ago, I set up a charity here in Australia that is called Pain Revolution. Yeah. Uh, and anyone can go and look it up, painrevolution.org. And what we do is we are specifically targeting the way healthcare professionals understand how pain works and the way the general public understands how pain works. Because as long as the general public is coming in and asking for treatments that we know don't work, right, or we know are risky, then healthcare professionals sort of have to deliver them regardless of what they think. So we need to get the general health, the general public to understand how pain works and what recovery, what the pathway to recovery is most likely to be. And we need to get the healthcare professionals to understand that. And then the thing that is the most challenging for us and will be very challenging in you know, where you live is getting in place the funding streams to support that. Yep. In, in Australia at the moment, if you have chronic pain and you're not on a compensation system, so you weren't injured at work or you don't have life insurance uh, and you can't afford to pay $150 a session for a good allied health professional, then you, you cannot access care for chronic pain. There is, there is no avenue for you. And I imagine there'll be places in your country that will be very similar to that. Uh, there are. So I think we need a revolution uh, because what is completely clear in chronic pain is the most, most effective treatments we have are education, so you understand how pain works and you understand what the best things to do are, and they are also psychological and active therapies. So mindfulness, meditation, that we know they're good things to learn how to do, to move, yeah. stay, to stay active, you know, movement, is so you know we were talking about the, the effects of mindfulness the effects of movement are profound and multi-system as well even imagining movement if you can't move if you hurt too much to move imagining movement will deliver sims into your amplifier you know, you know that uh laws I, I just gotta interrupt you real quick because our business partner mine and, and will's business partner dr Teresa larson doctor of physical therapy she's actually who introduced me to you and your work and yeah, she right. always talks about motion is lotion and how yeah, it's yeah. not just for your body but it's also for your mind and how you handle different things in your life so uh, i love that you hit on that as we're as we're coming to an end um that said just keeping an eye on time i again want to respect your time yeah. Um, Thanks, mate. Uh, I know we're wrapping it up. So uh, if, if people hear this, when people hear this rather, because I know we do have, <laughs> we do have some listeners, um, how can they find you if they want to find more information on, on you and your work? 
what's the best way for them to find well, out? Well, um, you know, I, I'm pretty easy to find because I've got an unusual first name, right? So my first name <laughs> is actually Lorimer, uh, which is French for bridal maker, apparently. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> but I'm easy to Google, but it'd probably be better not to, I mean, don't search for me. Right. Search for all the groovy stuff that's out there. And uh, Pain Revolution is one site that you could start at. It's a beautiful Pain site. Painrevolution.org. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you just start exploring. And uh, you know, we, in this book that we've uh, co-writing with a guy called David Butler, who's uh, the national treasure in Australia. Um, and in that book, well, one of the first pages is we ask people to complete their open-mindedness scale. Right. So if, if, you've, if you're challenged mm. by persisting pain uh, and you want to take the, the most current contemporary approach to this problem, you're going to have to have an open mind because the most current contemporary approach goes against a lot of principles of, of uh, treatment of chronic pain because it's, the emphasis is on you have to retrain your brain and body over time. So you're going to need a coach to help you do that to strategize, to learn skills along the way, to become good at meditation and mindfulness. You know, not just do it, become good at it. Right. You have to practice, you have to learn stuff because this is all ultimately about neurotags. This is all about neural pathways and we have to strengthen the neural pathways that produce safety messages within the brain. I mean, a thought is a nerve impulse, right? It's not this flaky thing it's a real life nerve impulse and and we want to try and retrain the neurotags that create thoughts that are dims all right but you're going to have to do that yourself so you have to you have, you have to have an open mind and we have this open mind scale open mind in the scale where people rate okay how prepared am i to take on this challenge and this pathway forward um you know it's like slowly getting off heavy opioids you've got to take mm. it slowly you got to learn how to how to manage your system Right? And if you're not on opioids, then you've got an advantage there. Uh, but you still have to learn stuff over time and right. slowly train and, and get a coach. And if people rate themselves as nothing works for me, nothing will ever work, right? then we say, fair enough, that's the place you're in. Don't bother with this strategy. Yeah, close mind. This approach. Yeah, because you, there's no point. There's absolutely right. no point. So you do need courage, you need patience, yeah. you need persistence. And you need a good coach. And what Pain Revolution is trying to do is to create more good coaches. And I know there are good operators in North America uh, out there. Um, one of the, the company that sells my books is called Noigroup.com. So if, if there are health professionals listening, look up Noigroup.com. Uh, and, and I think also North America, OPTP sells books that I've written. And, then there, and there are other good books. Uh, there are some books that are effectively rip-offs of mine, so they're very good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, I love it. Anyway, there's lots of places you can go, but you've got to change your mindset into, okay, I'm not looking for someone to fix this now. I'm looking for my pathway towards improvement and, and for many people, ultimately, full recovery. But it's a, it's a journey. Well, it's nice you came full circle because you started with saying pain is a mind fucked mindfuck and here we are talking about first thing you need to do in order to release persistent pain and kind of begin to bring more of those sims into your life and all the things we talked about is just having an open mind you know instead of just yeah. looking for the quick fix or you know the next cortisone shot or you know whatever the next pill is going to come on the market I mean, because that's just really masking the pain i'd imagine um so well you well, know the the most challenging thing for um in Australia, they're called pain specialists, medical specialists in pain. The most challenging thing for people with chronic pain in front of those guys and girls is that they don't have any drugs that have good evidence of efficacy. They don't have any procedures that have good evidence of efficacy. I mean, there, there are occasional exceptions to that. But if we're just talking about pain, the very best treatments that exist are around learning about your pain, learning how to work your amplifier, learning mindfulness, cognitive behavioural skills, slowly becoming more active, movement and load, you'll be on the right road, load <laughs> yeah. and move, you'll be in the groove, motion is lotion. <laughs> Love it.
<laughs> Ter Teresa's going to love this. <laughs> yeah. Loss, uh, it's been so great having you on here. Uh, Will, if you would just run us through a, a quick grounding practice and we'll wrap it up yeah. if we've got time. Well, hey, maybe a couple uh, breaths. Yeah, let's, let's, let's put us in, uh, you know, some uh, safety in me moment, there right? We're go. just going to take a few breaths and we're going to do a little uh, a parachute breath. So we're just going to take three. We're going to take a really like a robust inhale really quick. And then we're going to take a long exhale out the mouth. So or just imagine yourself as you exhale, like you're kind of a parachute floating down to the earth. If you close your eyes, if you're safe, if not, keep your eyes open, ground yourself as much as you can. Exhale out. Try to get all the way empty if you can. And let's take that big hit of an inhale. Exhale out slow. All the way out. Again. Really softly, very gently. Go easy. Be patient. Exhaling, exhaling, exhaling. And one more. And there we have it, gentlemen. There we have it. Uh, Laz, it has been such a pleasure uh, to have you here um, um, and teaching us all about pain. And, and it's amazing. If anyone wants to really just <laughs> type in uh, Dr. Lerner, uh Mosley uh, on YouTube and you'll have tons of videos that are come up and you can really tons. get down the rabbit hole that John and I went down. And it's just fascinating work that you're what you're exploring and understanding about pain. And, and thank you for sharing your wisdom here today with us. And it uh, really thanks, helps. It's helped uh, me a lot. Well, congratulations for the work you're doing. It's, it's such you. an important offering. And the, uh, I love the, the audience that you're targeting. You know, Thank folks you. Like me. <laughs> and it's, um, yeah, it's really good. Congratulations. And thanks so much for having me on your show. Pleasure. Thank pleasure. You. All right. Well, until next time, everyone, thanks, take care. Peace. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you walk away with some new tools and insights to guide you on your life journey. New episodes are being published every week, so please join us again for some meaningful discussion. For more information, please check out mentalkingmindfulness.com.